Good morning, everybody. Weird. Good morning in Utah. It was snowing last night where I live, and it's cloudy and looks ugly and cold. I haven't been outside yet today. But typically, this time of year, um, we're debating turning on the water for our sprinklers and turning on our sprinklers and I probably mowed the lawn a time or two. I haven't even gotten the lawnmower out. But part of that is um, dealing with an injured ankle this week. So I don't know if you guys the crutch background, but I've been on, been on crutches and in a boot. Luckily today I'm starting to feel better. Still need to keep the inflammation down so it'll heal properly, but things are going well. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, um, a good friend. I can find her. I didn't have that up on screen. <laughs> uh, Here we go. Here we go. So, um, a good friend, um, start writing some content. Stuff is good, like really good. Um, I really enjoyed her async await. And she's going into some cool stuff about um, and promises and things that you should know. Even though in Angular we use, um, we, we tend to use observables and things like that. Um, I start seeing more promise code and more async and await code once you start getting into signals and stuff like that. Um, so very, very helpful. I actually haven't read this one. Um, really interesting. I read through the other two. Oh, this is, um, this is cool. Very, very cool. Um, but yeah, you, you should go check her stuff out. I really have been enjoying it. Uh, you just, let me know on Friday, and so I've been reading an article as I get time, and it's been really good. I've really enjoyed it. I like her writing stuff. So highly recommend you should go check her out. Um, check her stuff out. Careful about the way. Speak, speak old school, and sometimes old school is not the right way to speak anymore. But um. Yeah, go check her articles out. Um, give her a follow on Medium um, if you feel like it. Uh, but I, I've really enjoyed the stuff she's been writing. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Just before the stream, and before every stream, I like to do this. I, I go in and I update stuff. Um, I, I like to stay as up to date as possible. Um, the tool I like to use is called. Um, npm check update and when you install it it installs this helper ncu um, you can throw in this format group and that's what will give you this nice output like this or um, up here nice output that looks like this um, we can see there's a couple of things still left to update i'm not going to update them um, but one thing i did want to call out is ESLint 
as a major upgrade. Um, and typically I like to follow those major upgrades, um, but before I do, I always like to go to the website and just make sure what we're looking at um, isn't going to be a big change, right? Um, or potentially that devastating, like always a change, um, a major change. Um, if they're using Semver, a major change always points to breaking changes. Um, and so in the beginning, I was like, oh, this isn't too bad. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, there's a new default. Uh, we removed some formatters. Okay. They updated some rules. That's fine. You know, some other things. Um, and, you know, these, these are all like, okay, yeah, that, that's fine. I'm fine with all these changes. I don't think they should affect me too bad. And then I got here to the plugin developers. Um, and suddenly I'm like, oh, if my plugins aren't upgraded, then I'm in trouble. Um, so what I'm going to do um, for now is I'm going to wait for the plugins to upgrade. Um, that means that we'll probably reach the ESLint 9 upgrade when NX upgrades. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll play with it in another project. Um, experiment with it in another project. Um, but in this project, I don't want to get too distracted on um, ESLint and other tools like that. Um, I actually want to get into the CMS portion of this as quickly as we can, um, so I don't want to get too distracted. But checking to make sure that things look good. Both. Okay, so I, I don't want to get too distracted. I want to get into the CMS portion. I actually want to, um, one of the things I want to figure out is can I make um, my CMS give, um, give markdown and then analog, can it render that markdown from the um, CMS? That's what I'm really, really um, curious about and excited to, figure out, I don't know which CMS I'm going to use. Um, so today we're probably going to experiment with some stuff I want to, I want to do, um, I want to do some parallax scrolling um, to see if we can do some interesting things um, with, with the DOM. I may even take a look at, um, There was a there was a talk at ng-conf about um, applying different kinds of what do we want to call it um, animations. And it was given by Mike Hardington, and he discussed a way to um, animate things in the DOM um, using CSS um, instead of the Angular animations. And it was really, really compelling and fun. So I'm curious if we can experiment with something like that too. Um, our animations will probably be a bit over the top uh, because tuning animations can be difficult. But let's uh, let's go let's serve our project and. No, I don't want to run test. Px nx, and we're going to serve our Angular blog. And so we can talk about this a bit as we continue. But there, there are a couple of things I just want to learn myself, um, animations-wise, and. I need to spend some time figuring out a CMS. I'll have a CMS figured out before tomorrow. I'll have it set up and I'll have it ready for the stream tomorrow. Um, assuming that we get to the point where we need a CMS, well, I need to do that anyway. Um, so I will get the CMS all set up. Um, I'll pick one. 
if you guys feel strongly about, you know, you'd love to see a certain CMS used, um, you know, let me know in the chat. I would, I'll be happy to look into, you know, CMS that you guys want to see. So here we go. It looks like everything is good. Bring up. Over here. So here's our app. Um, and you know, we've got our animations going on. Our, there's like two. Support. Talking about a disconnect port. It was optimizing Faker and it was optimizing the CDK layout. That's all good. Anyway, the, the thing that we added right now, not a lot here, but we added this image here. And this image has some interesting properties to it that we can probably see. We go into like a mobile view. Already, I can tell that this mobile view is just way too big. Be looking at fixing that. But as we you'll watch the um, watch the lines and stuff, and as we increase the size, oh, that was a decrease in size. So let's let's take a look at like a, this is an iPhone 14. Um, and this is just way too big, so we'll we'll need to look at the height on a mobile responsive. But as we go bigger, you'll see that if you look, we aren't stretching the image. The image is staying the same same size. You can see the flag here is the same size. This is the same dimensions and size. Um, we're we're using um, CSS to um, tell the browser that, hey, resize the image so that it maintains the same aspect ratio, um, but then fit it within this box. And while it's within this box, um, we're going to, um, you know, then I'm asking the browser to crop pieces off. Um, and that's done. Turn this off. That's all done with this object fit cover. If I remove this, notice how like image here starts to shrink and then these lines are weird and things start to distort. As soon as I put it back, right, it's the right proportion. Everything is starting to look good and they aren't distorting. And this actually wound up being a really nice image to use this with. Um, the other thing we can do is we can click and we can see you know, the image size. Changing. We did this on Friday using a generator. So every time we click, it's just going to swap image size. And the code for that was actually kind of fun. Um, we just bound the height to a CSS variable, and then we have the signal. Um, and the signal starts out at 320 pixels. And then what we did is we added. This is a generator function, just a pure JavaScript generator. And this function, um, it's an infinite loop, but it's using yields. Um, and so the first time it runs, it's going to yield the value 160, the next time 320. Um, and then the next time it's going to hit the end, it's going to go back to the beginning of the loop and yield 160 and then 320. So it's just going to constantly um, go through. Yield is like the return value, um, like return. Except what yield does is it says, hey, um, I'm going to stop processing here, give the um, stop the function here, and the next time you call this function, I'm going to pick up at this point and go forward. So it's really, really nice for um, generating like a series of values like this that you want to repeat over and over again. Um, because typically, the other way you could do this in um, you know in Angular is 
um, you, you would add a flag, right? Um, and that flag, when it was true, would be smaller, and when it was big, it would um, you know show the bigger image and toggle back and forth. And that works pretty well. Um, but what if I wanted to add like a um, 240 pixel mix, and maybe didn't want to add a 400 or well, yeah, 480. That sounds good, right? So now we've got four images to show. Um, and so now you're switching from a simple Boolean to now, um, you know, much more complicated logic. Uh, when a generator, you don't even have to change the code. You just change your, your breakpoints, basically. Um, and now if we go in, the first click is smaller, slightly bigger. That's the original size. That's the bigger size. Um, and notice the, what do we want to, like the, the image proportions are staying the same. So like this lantern here, um, as we resize, um, it's staying the same size, but what it's doing is it's keeping, um, it's sizing the image to have the same dimensions. So here where it's thinner, what it's resizing for is the wide. Right. Um, and so it's sizing to fit the width, and then it's chopping off the top and the bottom to zoom in. Um, when we go here, it's doing the same, but we're getting more of the light. Um, and then here we're getting more of the light. And then at 480, you notice that it's chopping off the sides, but we're getting the full top to bottom. So it's resized the image to go top to bottom, and then it's chopping in the sides and keeping it centered and everything. Um, and if we if we take this um, we take this object fit off, you'll see that <laughs> we get really distorted images. Uh, but if we leave it on, now we can fit any any size, um, and based on the size of the image, things are going to look really. Hey, this looks like smart people wrote it. I don't like it, bro. Aubrey <laughs> Lores, it's good to see you, man. Um, I had a really good conversation um, with Abra Lores. Um, I had a lot of fun talking to him about the, uh, the Linux hack um, and the hacker who spent time um, basically impersonating a good actor and then started sneaking in this hack and how it was caught. It was a lot of fun talking to Abra Lores and he gave me good information. It was a fascinating hack. It's good to see you, man. Thanks for joining. But yeah, um, and that's that's one of the things that I encourage you to think about as you're, you know, as you're thinking your way through things. Um, sometimes the way that you always do things may not be the best way, and this has been driven home to me by the project that I'm working on at at work we're, we're working on a brand new project that's doing something that we haven't done before um and because of that it's it's giving me the opportunity to look at stuff that you know how we've done it always in the past um at bill and be like should we do it this way um and sometimes I'm that annoying guy in the meeting, um, and, and I realize this, and I try not to be, but um, I think it's an important piece of what we're doing. But sometimes I'm the annoying guy in the meeting that's like, everybody's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, uh, does that really make sense? Could we really be doing that? What if we do something else? Um, so... Um, and then, you know, there, a lot of times that annoying guy, guy or gal, right, in that meeting who is potentially, potentially asking questions. They just care. Um, so sometimes it's worth listening to them. Sometimes it's not. Um, and quite often, um, easy to get off topic or it's easy to start solutioning um, and things like that. And 
So, you know, if you feel the need to be that person, um, go for it. Um, but one thing that uh, I'm getting feedback on, and I, I probably, uh, well, I know I need to get better at it, is just reading the audience. You know, certain certain meetings are not the right place to do that. So I'm learning to do that better. But um, yeah, again, instead of, you know, using ifs and stuff like that um, and changing classes, maybe bind to a CSS variable um, and use a generator, right? There might be other ways to do it. Um, the only reason I would suggest that you maybe not do it that way is um, consistency within the company, right? You want to make sure that you stay consistent and that um, the devs that are working on your stuff can um, work on it with confidence. But let's, this is kind of fun. And I think um, our parallax, we can, we can use this. So um, you know this is this is the this is the 320 size. Um, the 480 size is definitely too big. But at the 320 size, um, we can get the article title and the byline. We'll go here, and then uh, we can get a decent intro to the article. Um, and then what I'm thinking is that we can use parallax. Um, and one thing we could do um, to show kind of what I'm thinking, and this is the, um, this is the other um, cool thing about this is um, go backward. There we go. So, the other cool thing about this is we can um, we can continually loop through our array. Um, and well, this isn't even an array. This is just hard coded sizes, right? But I just flipped the direction that we're going to go so that I can demonstrate something, right? Um, so our parallax could, right, as they start scrolling, um, the image could stop here. And when they scroll again, it could stop here. Um, and then this could stay fixed. Um, and then the the title could fly off to the side, who knows? And then the article could up. And then we just scroll through the article. Um, just something fun like that. So it's always good to experiment with your site because you'll get, uh, you might get ideas as you're, I, I like that idea that. The, the cool thing about this is as we animate this, it's going to appear that we're zooming into the picture. So it'll give a cool effect to the image. And then you know, the title might fly off and then, right? And so now our blog um, is more interesting. You're probably gonna get people um, scrolling back and forth to watch the effect, which is fun. So uh, just to check, take a look at chat, Abradores, I have something on my mind. Let me know if you would like to discuss it. I'm thinking that tech changes very fast, and I'm not sure that I want to spend so much time on tech that changes every two years. Ideally, if I can just write tech in one specific way that never changes, I could focus on stuff like marketing, building, et cetera, et cetera. Why does it feel like a waste of time to just learn new stuff if the already established stuff just Um. <laughs> Man, that, that is an amazing snipe for me. Um, with that comment, <laughs> you're, you're definitely, you definitely know how to snipe me. Um, so let's, let's talk a bit, right, um, about what you're, you're discussing. Um, and there are some things in, in tech that are universal um, and that don't change. Those are like your fundamentals are going to be universal and they won't change, right? What do I mean by fundamentals? Um, loops. 
every language has a concept of loops. Um, not, well, yeah, every language still has a concept of loops. There are some languages that are, um, that are tail, um, tail call optimized. Um, and tail call optimization allows languages that use recursion for looping um, to have loops that run, you know, for millions of times without exhausting your stack. Um, so um, every every language has the concept of loops. How they do those loops might change, right? Um, and so um, a lot of the function, like purely functional languages, don't have for loops. Um, and that, um, hey, Chris, welcome to the stream, man. Good to see you here. Um, Chris is a famous, uh, famous, uh, Chris is, I'll say Chris is famous. He's one of, uh, he's one of the, um, Angular community meetup organizers um, that I that I got to know pretty well through that Angular community meetup. Um, really, really cool guy, um, and he's also a fellow GDE. Um, he got his GDE just before I got mine, um, and he. Um, I don't want to dox you too hard, Chris, um, but. Um, Thank you for showing up. You're not famous. <laughs> I, I'd argue you're probably more famous than I am, Chris. Um, great guy. Um, he he writes great stuff for the Hero Devs blog. Um, he organizes the Angular Community Meetup. And um, watch out for Chris because I know he's. Um, are you speaking or um, do you have CFEs? I don't remember if you're actually speaking. But um, there are some events. Um, Chris, Chris will be speaking, which will be cool. Um, so yeah, definitely check him out. Um, really like Chris. Thanks for showing up. Um, anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, fundamental stuff, loops, right? Con control structures. Um, so by control structures, it's things like if, um, you know, switch, things like that are fairly constant across languages. Again, functional languages are different, um, and so they might do things differently. Um, so like purely functional languages will use recursion to do looping, um, and then they might use um, functions like filter to do things like if statements. Um, yeah, fall, yeah. Um, and you guys, Chris being here just reminded me, I need to get in contact with Marcus and Adi. Um, we've been talking about TinyConf. Um, we need to get serious about it. So thank you for the reminder, Chris. I need to get into that too. Um, anyway, so looping, uh, control structures, um, you know, things like that are going to be consistent throughout time. Um, so your fundamentals are, are things that aren't going to change. Um, and that's where things like code katas um, become really, really cool. Um, and I just got the shirt from Backblitz. So it just arrived. I need to get it washed and probably wear it. This lightning bolt here, you guys can see how it's going to show up on stream. But that lightning bolt is a, is a cone. And cones are incredibly fascinating to me. Um, that cone is the code, produce that code in that lightning bolt. Um, so the code creates that lightning bolt, which holds the code that creates that lightning bolt, right? Cones are really, really cool things. Um, if you guys haven't ever heard of them, um, they're something really, really fascinating um, that I've never solved on my own, but 
you know, there's there's this whole um, the uh, we can find. You can find any JavaScript or ESLint, but Python's typically pretty easy to follow. So if we go take a look at like this one, inside of here will be the, the various cones. Um, so um, oh, these are all tests. I don't know. I need to look it up. But cones are really, really cool. You guys should go check them out if you need them um, or, or if you're interested. But basically, what you do is you write a program, and the whole point of that program is to reproduce the source code of the program. Um, and it sounds really, really simple at first. I've never created one by myself from scratch because I get the concept, but I always... I always mess it up at some point to where um, I can't reproduce the exact same output as it, it's fascinating. Um, just really, really fascinating. Um, you know, some the the rules that I follow when I create um, when I try to create cones are um, I don't want to read from a file because it, it feels a little bit cheaty to me. Um, I want the entire source code to reproduce itself. So that is probably um, one of the pinnacles of um, code katas. And code katas are exercises that you, you repeat over and over and over again um, to get better at certain parts of coding, right? Um, and so early on in my career, I experimented with looping. Um, and you know the, the fundamental loops um, in most languages, you've got your for loop, your while loop, and your do while loop. You can also use things like go to and labels, um, which I don't recommend in most programming languages, but I do recommend um, doing, you know, figuring out some katas for yourself um, and, and practicing looping that way too. Um, you know, and then maybe practicing control structures. So, like if statements. Um, one thing, so. I don't have a degree, but I did um, study electrical engineering for a while and then decided I liked programming. One thing I really loved about electrical engineering um, was truth tables. And truth tables are a really powerful tool to allow you to write down Boolean logic and then take that Boolean logic um, and condense it down to simpler operators. Um, and so, um, if we go, go to Excala draw here, um, and this is the, this is the idea for our page, right? Um, but let's, let's talk about a truth table, right? Um, and so let's say we've got this, um, let's say we've got this logic, right? A or and, right? Um, and um in a lot of logic um you'll typically write your ors with the caret and then ands typically wind up being some form of multiplication and so how would we create this truth table well we've got three variables so um, we need the values for each variable, and then we need the, the truth table, right? Um, so basically what we would do is we need to have A, B, C, E, and then the value here. Um, and so it's, it's four outputs from our truth table. Um, so we would have a line here, and this represents A. And then a line here, this would represent our B column. A line here this represents our C column. And I obviously didn't do well. Uh, line, 
Ah, it doesn't. But we can move these a little bit better. A little have our space be a little bit more even. There we go. So in this case, what we would have is we would have our A. Have our we would have our we would have our result. So this this is what um, a truth table is set up like, right? Um, and then the first thing you do is for the A, um, you would typically go through and you know what? Maybe this is better done. In That would be here. So go ahead and just set this up. We've got our A, B, and C here. Um, we'll, we'll do the same, right? A, B, and then result. There we go. And then here, what we would start with is we would have um, zero, um, and then B would be zero, and then C would be one. Um, and we need to also have, right, so we'll write this out so that we understand it, A or B and C. Um, one thing I'm also going to do is just make sure that we have And you know what? We'll, we'll go down to just two inputs, right? We'll go to A or B and now, uh, yeah, yeah, that'll be cool. Um, so, um, and you know what? Let's also write this, right? Um, truth tables are powerful. We're going to take out the C column. We are two. We're going to just enter everything. So what we do for this is we go through, you know, zero 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 and then, zero 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 one, and then we have one zero one one, right? So these are our values. Um, and so then we run this just through the, um, we run it through, you know, the, what do we want to call it? Drawing a blank here. We run it through the, um, the statement, right? So zero or zero is false. So we don't even have to evaluate the second half because it will always be false. So this is false, right? Um, Zero or one is true, right? So this first half is true. Um, so then we evaluate with the not A, um, and we get a true. So this is true. Um, and one, you know, I'm actually going a little bit too far into this. Um, we, we should insert two other. Well, we should insert one column to the left. Um, and this column should be our A or B. And this column should be our A or B and not A, right? So here we said that A or B is zero. Um, so we don't even have to reevaluate, we don't have to go further than this, right? Here, A or B is a one. Um, and so then we evaluate not A, um, and you know we can insert one column to the left. This is where we evaluate not A, right? Um, and this becomes a one. And this becomes a one. Um, and so um, we can see, you know, as we move through this, we can see how um, the truth table helps us evaluate our logic statement, right? 
Um, so here, A or B is a one, not A is a zero. This has to be a zero. Um, and here we see A or B is a one, not A is a zero. So this also has to be a zero. Um, so we can see that there's only one case where, um, where we even get a true. Um, and that case is in the case of um, E and not A. So we can actually say, by, by just evaluating this and seeing that there's only one row um, that evaluates to um, the true, um, this one row tells us how we can simplify this. And in this case, where B is true and A is false, that's the only case where we get a true. We can simplify this. We can say that this actually simplifies down to B and not A, right? Um, and this is a classic case um, of um, what do we want to say? This is a classic case of this is a classic logic gate um, test um, case. So in this case here, we have one, two, and then the not is a third logic gate. Um, so if we were mass producing this, this is 33% um, more expensive than this and and the not. Um, the other thing that winds up being interesting is that in a lot of architectures, and is actually a cheaper gate because or is sometimes made up of ands and nots. Um, so this winds up to be a cheaper way to do it. And we can prove this out, right? Because we've got our A or B, and then we can just add here. We can just say B e and not A. And you know what, let's, let's move it out here. We'll do B and not A, right? So that it matches. Um, and then, you know, we're going to do our 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1, 1. And so out here, right, zero, zero and, and, and one, right? Because here um, we, can, we can make this not a, just to this simple. So this becomes one, one, zero, zero. Um, so we're just looking at these. So zero and one is zero. One and one is one. Zero and zero is zero. And one and zero is zero. Um, and so we get the exact same truth table. So we know our simplification has been uh, much. Um, palindromes are a fun cut. That's another good one, Chris. Um, and palindromes are something you're likely to get asked in um, um, in a, in a coding contest, or not a coding like an interview. Often in coding contests, in an interview, you're likely to get some form of palindrome problem. Um, so. We can see that this truth table is exactly the same. Um, another thing, right? Like before, I said that quite often. Um, well, and it, so A or E um, and not A, right? So um, this is. This is typical um, way to write this. And there's a reason that the or is written as a plus sign. Um, and we can see it here in this A or B. Um, if, if, we, if we treat these like binary numbers, right? And we're only taking the, um, the rightmost digit of the binary number, um, that's not true. But the reason it's often written as a plus is 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1. Um, but if we, if we potentially treat this like a clamp operation where we clamp it between 0 and 1, then 1 plus 1 clamps to 1, right? Um, and so that's why it's typically written as a plus, because um, it's just a mental shortcut when you're writing out truth tables. 
And then why is um, and written as um, multiplication? Well, zero times one is zero. One times one is one times zero, zero. Um, and so kind of a mental thing, right? Um, and there are all sorts of different notations for this. But this is the one that I'm most familiar with. And anyway. Getting back to the question that got me so off track before we even started writing any code today. Um, truth tables are incredibly powerful um, because writing out a truth table allows us to do interesting things. Like what is the inverse of B and not A or even, even more, um, right? Like, I see this all the time. Um, I see somebody just throw a not symbol on the front, A or E, um, and not A, right? This bothers me <laughs> a lot, and I see it a lot, but um, the reason it bothers me so much Am I trying to be an Excel program? I'm talking about truth tables. The reason this bothers me a lot is that we simplify. Um, so if we've taken the time to simplify this to B and not A, um, then the simplification of this logic becomes really, really simple. The simplification of this logic is not B or A, right? And so if we write out our truth table again, right? Zero, zero, one, one. And here we go, zero, one, zero, one. Um, so this will be our not B, and this will be our not B e or A. Um, and we need to go up. Right, so if we're correct, this line, this line, and this line should be green. So this is how we'll know if we got things correct, is that these three lines should be green, right? So we'll go through and we'll do our not B. It goes to one, zero, one, zero. Um, and then, the next thing we're going to do is do not B or A. Well, in this case, not B or A. Ooh, we're not B is a one. Um, never mind. I, I was in my head. I was trying to do this again. I was like zero. And two. No, this is a one, right? Because not B is a one. So zero or one is a one. Here, not B is a zero. A is a zero. So we're at a zero. Um, here, not B, because I copied, cut and pasted, it took the formatting too. Here, um, one or one is a one, and here, one or zero is a one. And so we can see that using truth tables, we've been able to first simplify what looks like a much more complicated if statement to its much more simple equivalent, right? Um, this is the equivalent of the one above. And then we were able to negate it um, because negating two terms is super simple. Negating three terms becomes much more difficult. Um, and, you know, the negation of this is not A and B or A, um, which A. And actually, is that? No, that's not the negation. See, I'm already messing up the negation. Um, the, the negation comes um, not A and not B or A. And that's that's where um, that's where 
you know, practicing this stuff becomes important. So not A and not B. So in this case, not A and not B would be a one, right? Or A, um, which is a zero, but we still get a one. Um, and you know we can we can figure this out right not a and not here this is this would just be a and then this would be um not a not b or a right get our zero zero one one and this is where i think things like this become really important concepts to learn so not A and not B is actually a one. Not A is a one, not B is a zero. Um, here, not A is a zero, not B is a zero, so that's a zero. And then here we get um, not A is a zero, not B is a zero, so this is a zero. Um, so here we've got um, a one or zero, so that's a one. We've got a zero or zero, so that's a zero. We've got a zero or one, so that's a one, and we've got a zero or one. So my negation is correct, right? We've we've proven that in that it matches this. And it is the inverse of this. Um, and that's where truth tables become really, really powerful. Um, and there, there are some optimizations in here that we can do. Um, when you when you optimize, you look for um, similar groupings. Um, so we can see here um, that this similar grouping, there's a similar grouping here of a bunch of zeros. There's also a similar grouping here of a bunch of ones. There's a similar grouping here of a bunch of zeros. And so this, this allows us to make decisions about what's going on. Um, and that um, this would allow us to simplify. Um, so we can see when A is true, that we're quite often true. Um, so that's what allows us to um, but in this case, we've got not a, there's, it becomes, doing these groupings is important. Um, they'll help you simplify it, but it's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're doing. Anyway, getting back to where I got sniped, right? Um, and you sniped me good, Abra Lores. Stuff like that is fundamental to programming. It's fundamental to most logic-based endeavors. So learning your logic really well is important. Learning looping structures is important. Learning control structures is important. Um, you know, then where do you go from there? What things don't change from there? Um, design patterns typically don't change. So the notion of facades doesn't change. The notion of um, you know proxies doesn't change. The notion of um, flyweights and things like that they don't change. Um, implementation from language to language or framework to framework changes, um, but um, the the concepts themselves remain universal. And if I go talk to a React dev and I start talking about what I'm doing, um, you know, we may not understand each other, but if I start using concepts of, you know, um, you know I, I'm proxying this, or I put a facade on this, or things like that, um, suddenly we understand what each other's talking about, even if I don't understand the nuances of the language or the intricacy, right? Um, one thing that's interesting is observables are a design pattern, um, and they have been since forever. The notion that you could have something that emits events and have something observe it and react to that, that's observables. And so when when you deal with like event 
driven programming, that's observables, um, right? So observables aren't a new concept to Angular. They aren't new to RxJS. Um, applying them in the way that they are is definitely a new concept, right? Uh, it takes some getting used to. But the, the concept of observables, um, you could go talk to anybody who you know, has been programming since the 60s. They, I'm using the observer pattern. And they will understand observables better if they understand the pattern. So that, that's the next thing, right? Understand your logic, understand your fundamentals, understand your patterns. Those things don't change. Once you realize that, um, then the nuances of languages um, or, or frameworks, you know, changing and, you know, two or three times a year, um, it's, uh, you know, some things change faster than that. So if you're feeling like things are changing too fast, um, my suggestion is to get a stronger handle on the things that don't change, um, because that's going to help you understand what the changes are and why they're important. So, you know, when, when people talk about signals and they don't like signals um, or, um, or they're super excited about signals, but they don't know why. Um, you know, if, if you understand theory behind signals and observability and reactivity and things like that, right, fundamental features of web design, um, then you're going to understand whether you like signals or you don't like signals and why, right? Same thing with RxJS versus async and await. You know, and it also helps you understand, you know, how do I track down race conditions? How do I do this? How do I do that? Right? And um, it, it helps you to understand things like generators, right? Um, this generator is really weird because to, you know, somebody who hasn't been, you know, exposed to this syntax, what is this even doing? You know, why did he write such a tight loop? Like, if this wasn't a generator, this would break your browser because it's just in a really, really tight loop running three lines of code over and over and over again, and it's just going to eat up your entire event loop. It's never going to yield time to anything else. Your browser is just going to. Um, but if we understand that this is an infinite loop um, and we understand that next yields, gives up its time when it runs that yield command until it's called next, um, then we're in a good place to understand why this code helps, why it's not, why it's not breaking the browser. So to answer your question, Aubrey Lord, um, fundamentals. If, if you're feeling like tech is changing too much, get your fundamentals right. Um, and this is especially important in, in systems that you're describing where things are changing rapidly, but you don't want to change. How do you handle that? Well, there are design patterns out there that can help you handle that. Um, there are ways that you can modularize um, what you're doing to minimize the impact of changes. Um, there are architectures out there, and that's that's the next step up, right? Um, so get good at programming. The next step is architecture, right? Discussing architectural patterns. How do you build software to do what you're talking about, Aubrey? Right? Um, as a dev, understanding architectural patterns is going to make you, it's going to take you to that next level. Um, and so, those are my suggestions. As you get yeah, DI, DI, for example, is a hugely powerful architectural pattern. Um, but there are times when DI is not the right answer and it sucks. Um, and if you can understand that and tell people about it, um, you could save your team from costly mistakes, right? Um, and so, you know, writing code. Um, will keep you firmly in the junior and mid developer range. And if you're comfortable there, stay there writing code. Doesn't matter, right? 
We need people that are comfortable writing code and can produce code faster than I can, right? Um, if that's what you want to do, do it and do it well, own it, right? Um, if you want to move out of that mid to like senior and then staff level and then architect level, start learning the theories, start learning the, um, you know, start learning why things are done the way they're done. Start thinking about things differently um, and you'll start moving up those levels, right? Um, <clears throat> but the, the difference between a mid and a senior developer um, sometimes is luck. In a lot of companies, it's luck. Um, you may not have, um, a lot of your seniors may not have the skills that people say seniors need. Um, they just happen to know how to make friends with the people making promotions and stuff like that. Um, but some of those are also, um, but in a lot of companies, the way you move up is by demonstrating that you have the skills for the next level. So, um, you know, the, the difference between a mid and a senior in my mind is a mid, you can give them any piece of code and they know the framework inside and out. Um, and they're going to write good code given, you know, the, the instructions that you a senior, when you give them a ticket, is going to look at the ticket, evaluate it in the context of the application and be like, what makes the most sense? Where should this be done? Can I reuse other pieces? Should we even do this ticket, um, right? That's, that's kind of senior level thing. Once you get into like tech lead, um, you're starting to introduce um, technical leadership. You're starting to need to communicate well. Um, and then once you get into like staff positions, um, now they're going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, um, we have this project that needs to do X, Y, and Z. How should we do it, right? Um, and so now you're getting into architectural, you're getting into thinking <clears throat> even broader picture, right? Like customers and things like that. Um, so, you know, if you want to move from mid to senior, um, start learning your code base, start learning your patterns, and start learning how to think about your code. If you want to move to senior to staff, now you need to start learning your business, um, understand your business, understand your customers, um, and start speaking the language of your, your, your PO, your product owners and your product managers, right? Your POs and your PMs. Um, and that's what's going to move you up the tiers, right? Um, especially um, if you can get to the point where you're trusted enough that you're the one that the POs and PMs keep coming to, um, and they like your solutions, and you speak their language, and um, you don't have to agree with everything they say. In fact, I disagree with my POs and PMs probably more than I agree with them. Um, but being able to communicate in a way that they understand why I disagree and then come up with a solution with them, right? Nobody ever wants to be told no. Um, but if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got this, this, you know, this idea, and you say, oh, well, maybe we should, right? Maybe that's not the best solution, but we could do this, this, and this. What does the customer really want, right? Um, then they're going to keep coming back to you because you're not just telling them no, you're telling them we shouldn't do what you asked, but we could do this other thing that's probably going to give the customer what. Yeah, Marcus, welcome to the stream, man. Lots of friends here today. Um, you know, Abra, Lores, Chris, and Marcus now. Myself working on mid to senior, and I recognize the things you are mentioning. Absolutely. I'm actually really surprised, Marcus, that you are not senior. You have a lot of those qualities that I would look for in a senior. And there are some people who are just really, really good at acquiring those qualities. Um, I have a good friend. Um, he works for NX now. And 
I was his dev lead for, he'd, he'd been at the company for six months. I was his dev lead for a month and I was rec um, recommending him for a senior, going from junior to senior. Um, because he had those qualities and he was so good at them. And um, the company actually fought me quite a bit, um, but he was one of the best promotions that we made at that company. Just really, really, really knew his stuff. So Marcus, you're you're one of those people that um, I recognize senior um, senior qualities in you, and and you don't have to have all of the qualities. Some of the stuff just has to be learned through experience. But the tendencies and the and, and the thought patterns and things like that are the important part. So yeah, I really hope I really hope you make it to senior, man. Anyway. Way off topic, right? Um, let's let's bring it back to the code. Right. An hour in, and we haven't written any code, but we have talked about a lot of other stuff, right? Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I really enjoy. Um, and it's also the reason that I started streaming. I stream Angular because I work in Angular. I understand Angular. I speak Angular really, really well. The reason I started streaming is to help the people who attend my streams um, understand what it takes to level up their career however they want. So don't feel bad about asking questions like that. Those are the kind of questions that I'm here to answer. Um, if you have code questions, ask those questions too. But you know, I may make comments like, oh yeah, it's an hour in and we haven't written any code. Um, that's more me recognizing the amount of time. That's not me commenting on Abradoris' question. I actually really, really liked his question. I think it was um, a very insightful question and uh, allowed us to discuss some important things. So that's my goal. My goal is to hear back from people who have attended my stream and they're like, hey, I watched your stream and I was able to go from mid to senior or I was able to go from junior to mid or who knows what, right? Um, those are the kind of things that make me really, really happy. The fact that I get to share Angular, which is a language that I love, and you know, analog has been this. I'm really excited about analog and single file components. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Abra Lawrence. I'm glad that I helped you go from senior to junior. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if that was your goal, I'm glad I helped you achieve your goal. Thank you. Um, that was good. But yeah, uh, you know, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. I can't, I, I used to answer a lot more personal messages. I can't um, anymore. I get so many personal messages now. I don't even know why. Um, but um, don't feel bad about messaging me, but if it takes me, you know, three, four, five days to get back, um, right now I'm super busy at work. Um, and so a lot of nights I just turn off my brain. Um, and um, right now I'm watching Lock and Key after work. Um, so I'll watch an episode of that and maybe go to bed or... Um, so I'm super busy there, um, and so a lot of times I'm not watching my social media as much as I do. Um, things are beginning to slow down, which is good because I'm looking forward to that slowdown to where I can get back into social media. Um, don't ever feel like you you can't approach me or message me. Always happy um, if I have time, and uh, you know if, if the question is. Um, if the question is something that I'm in the mood to answer, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, then I will definitely respond. But I will always be friendly. You know, as, as long as you're not being abusive to myself or to somebody else, I'll always be. But, you know, if you're going to be abusive, I'll, I'll call you out. Um, but yeah, don't, don't feel like you can't approach me. Um, and even at conferences, come up. Say hi, shake my hand. 
things like that. It was a lot of fun at ng-comp just to see old friends and meet, you know, meet new people. Um, so, yeah. Um, get back into the code. So, I like this idea of a parallax scrolling effect where as you scroll the first time, um, it's going to drop, you know, to the 240 size. As you scroll again, it's going to drop smallest size, and then it's going to stick until the article hits it, and it's going to scroll away. And the the title will make it fly away. Or do that, right? We're gonna do we're gonna do something crazy. And this is more for me to learn um, than anything. Um, but first, let's get let's get stuff on the page, and then we'll we'll get to that point. Um, we've got our image. Um, what do we want to do with this? Image? Well, first of all, this image should come from the article that's passed in. We aren't passing an article in yet. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, and this is very Angular specific. But in Angular, um, we can use inputs to read the, uh, read the um, URL parameters, right? So if we look, we've got this URL parameter here. Um, it would be nice if we could get this ID as an input to our function, right? And so we're going to go to angular.io. Join these two windows up. So, and actually, we're going to go to angular.dev. I'm going to search for URL in. See what we can find. So there is a provider. This is our provide router. Um, within provide router, we can actually provide. Nope. For active route, nope. Um, these, like, if you're looking to do an Angular kata, um, one of the ones that I used to do quite a bit was um, I would create a, an application that just had a text box on it that would respond to all the different router events and give me information in the te text box about them. And it can really help you understand when events are fired, when they're not fired, how to hook into those events, and all that fun stuff. Router URL param component input. I think. Um, so here we are setting them. Okay, so let's just look at component input. Common routing tasks. Um, this is what we're looking for. Oh, that's Pram's inheritance. This is what we're right here. Um, the component input binding. So 
here. Let's just grab this. And this will be um, your question. Yeah, uh, Abra Loris, I'm, I'm happy to answer. So, so random question, thoughts on sprite sheets. Would you recommend using them? Um, yes. They're like icons are, are a thing in applications, right? Uh, and one of the things that can break your tree shaking pretty quickly in an Angular application um, is if you use tech, like text-based SVGs and um, you start using those SVGs everywhere, it can make it difficult for Angular to tree shake your application. There are ways to get around that, right? Um, and like Material has the icon registry. There are other ways to get around it. Um, but one way that works really, really well and is the way that things like Font Awesome work, um, Font Awesome is a sprite sheet. Awesome. So if we go look at their icon, just, let's just search for, I don't know, signal icon, right? What they come up. So they have like a traffic like lots of different signals here. Okay. So we'll just look at this traffic light, right? Because it's not a pro icon. So when we go take a look at this, we'll see that it's an FA solid and an FA traffic light. If we inspect this, you'll see down here. Oh, they've gone to a font. So it is now a true font. In the past, it used to be a sprite sheet of SVG. And then they would just pull out the, the location within the sprite sheet. And it works really, really well. So it is now a true font. Um, FA dash traffic. Should be up at the top here. Traffic light. So F A dash the inline a solid, but yeah, it's a font because we can tell they're using like the font weight, popping for solid. Um, so. It is a font, but in the past, Font Awesome used to be a sprite sheet. Um, and there, there are a lot of other icon libraries like that that use sprite sheets. Um, and the thing about sprite sheets is that you can use them in your classes and reference you know, specific locations within the sprite sheet and do all your resizing and stuff like that. Um, there are also utilities out there that will optimize you can give like a directory of loose icons and then during your build, have that directory optimize things into sprite sheets for you. Um, and they'll optimize the images for you and do all sorts of cool stuff like that. So um, sprite sheets, yes. You know, just, it's like any other tool, make sure you're using the right tool for, you know, whatever you're doing. So, uh, 
um, you know, sometimes sprite sheets don't make sense, but in most cases they do. And I don't, you know, I don't build sprite sheets on on stream, but maybe that's something we could take a look at, right? Um, because like my Angular dinos had issues with um, with sprites. It probably had issues with tree shaking because of the way I used uses just in line. And there, there are different strategies to get around that. But sprite sheets is very common and very powerful. Anyway, we want to add the with component binding to our router. And so we're just going to go into our app.config. And our app config is um, we're using with fetch. But anyway, our app config is created by uh, NX, and I think it might be created by the Angular CLI now by default. Um, and so, you know, if we go take a look at our main.server.ts, you'll see that it's bootstrapping this. And then it's grabbing the config. Well, it's grabbing the server config. But the app server config is merging in the config, server config. No. Ooh. OK, so I, I learned another thing today. Um, this is probably a more performant way to merge configs. Um, and using the spread operator, that would be my guess. Maybe it uses a spread operator underneath, um, but I didn't know this was provided by Angular Core. Um, that's something I need to take back. My job. Um, another thing that I, I just learned today, merge application configs. So you can merge configs together. Um, and this is really useful if you have for example, the application I'm working on actually winds up being like 10 different applications um, because we're providing our code in different ways. Right? Um, it's really, really useful to have a common config and then just modify things in that config. Um, you wind up doing things with the spread operator, but merge application config. Part of Angular. Awesome. All right. Thank you for allowing me to indulge for a second. Um, that's cool. So the server config merges in the app config. Um, so the app config provides all of our other stuff here. Um, so if we want to add in our width, drawing a blank right now. So oh, with component in binding. Here we can go with component binding um, and this goes inside of our provide http client Oh no, it goes within my router. Oh. 
part of the Angular router. So there we go. We've got our component input binding. Um, one thing that I should take a look at. Do I need to do anything special with log? In here. On an input binding. Okay. So I don't have to do anything special. I just wanted to make sure that with the file router, I didn't have to do anything special. Um, so analog has its own special router that allows us to use the file system. I wanted to make sure I didn't have to do anything special with that binding. It doesn't look like I have to. Um, so we've now added the component input binding. Um, so the next thing we can do is we can just say, hey, const um, ID equals, here we can just say component, or we can just say input. We need to take a look at the route. And so here we've, we've called it article ID. We need to call it the same thing. So just say article ID. And that's going to allow us to have our ID. And so we can see that ID is an input signal of types. No, that's the wrong way to do Drawing a blank right now. Nulls monitor value trend. Here we're declaring input alias that signal inputs. Oh, doing it backwards. We just need to name it article ID match up. And now we can see that article ID is a string or undefined. Um, this should be string or or So now in our template, we'll just really, really quickly at the top, we'll just say pre. Here, we're just going to say ID article. And this needs to match the value from the route param. And so here we can see it's article ID. Um, and that, that's the name of the parameter in our route. So if we reload this, oh, oh, just put it inside of one of these divs. We'll put it inside of the. Go. 
console is not a Oh, I put it inside of that function. There we go. Now, article ID. Um, I shouldn't have been ignoring that error. Now we've got the article ID. And we can see that we're grabbing it from the end, right? And if I wanted to just call it ID, I would call it just ID, but I would need to alias. So so here we would just set it up as undefined and then we need to pass in. We're gonna alias it as article ID. Um, and that's going to break down here because now we don't have article ID. Now it's just ID. There we go. Now we've changed it and now it's just our ID. Now we can see, right? It's, it's still the same ID. But to make this work, all you have to do is make sure your variable name um, matches. Input type. That's it. Or if you don't want to match variable names, then you need to add an A. And unfortunately for um, signals, to add the options, you have to give it a, an initial value. So we're just going to start with value I actually don't like this pattern um, that's one of the things that I'd like to talk about um, sometime maybe and maybe we'll talk about it in this um, in this project um, but the the concept of um, like maybe or optional um, monads from like functional programming um, would allow us to do away with a lot of these undefined and undefined checks um, and things like that. Um, Wiseman Z or Z, Wiseman Z. That's a good question. A really good question. Probably such a good question that um, so if we do that, if we do input dot required, right? Here, need to make. Doing wrong. The required takes in, oh, required just takes in the ops already. So we've got our alias, got our article with ID, and we're fine. Um, thing is, can't even get to this page without the ID. Um, so that is a really, really good question. Um, and that is a great example of why, um, why coding with a team is always better than coding by yourself. Um, you have somebody who, who recognizes that, hey, there's maybe a better way to do this um, and, and call it out in a good way. Um, so I, I really appreciate the way you called it out, uh, Wiseman. It it was a good, you know, a good way to be like, hey, 
you know, did you think about this? I totally agree with what you just said. I've got a whole bunch of warnings here that we need to solve for, and we'll do that. to the head of the document. So we're going to go document head, our app. HTML. Just inside of here, we can just add that. That's just going to pre-connect to that site. That should solve one of our issues. This issue, the hydration, probably need to turn off. Um, so I, I need to fix the hydration. And this is where, um, so SSR and SSG, um, is getting a lot of love in Angular right now, um, but it hasn't been something that um, that I've been particularly good at. And so we need to fix the SSR and SSG stuff, and that's on my list of things to do, um, but definitely not something I wanna dive into today. The ng optimized image, um, it's detecting that we're changing the aspect ratio. It's saying, hey, your aspect ratio is 4.8, um, but we're rendering it at a 3.13. Um, so then we're intentionally We, we can clean this up, right? Curious, what happened? Because before I was using that, um, auto actually broke thing, right? So this image has a height and width on it, um, but if we add, got width full and height full, but what if we do um, width auto, height auto, right? That's going to add the CSS classes that it's telling us to add. Um, I don't want to take away the width, the full and the auto uh, fulls yet, place them with the autos. So now if I inspect this. Did we get That new class got the object cover. Did I put it in the right place? Did let's try. Um, and that might be something that um, Tailwind's doing is it's not allowing it to override, or maybe I'm doing it wrong. There's my see. This is why I'm not doing the width auto and the height auto. Um, so. Go back to our console, that error is gone, right? That warning is gone. Uh, but we're not getting the um, we're not getting the interaction that we wanted. So uh, we definitely want the full, not the autos. However, Make that warning go away. Um, I mean, one thing we could do, we go with full and we could do the height and base it on that CSS variable. So we could do var dash dash height, right? Um, and that might make the warning go away. 
I'm expecting some very important emails where it says that I have impressed. Every oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I really good luck, Aubrey Lores. I hope. Um, I hope it all goes well. I hope you get those emails. And you have a good one. Thank you. Oh, I have, yeah. Like I said, Abra Lores, I haven't checked Discord. Um, I'll go ch I'll go check Discord. I'm like particularly bad at Discord. Lots of other things I check every couple of days. Discord, for whatever reason, I don't check that often and I need to get better at it. Um, so I'll I'll go check that out. But yeah, good luck tomorrow, man. I, I really hope you get the emails you're talking about. Um but anyway, so now we're setting our height based on that variable. But we're, we're still going to get this. This can occur if width and height attributes are added to an image without updating the corresponding image styling. Um, I think the other thing I have to do here, um, because we're changing the height, See that that doesn't work though because now yeah. yeah to fix this provide see we can't set height as variable height starts as three twenty. And so this, my aspect ratio doesn't match. We'll have to figure out something around this because um, they're trying to protect me from, you know, the, the issues that I'm causing um, by resizing this image. But is it picking up? No, see, and it's also not picking that up either. So, and leave this as that's not going to solve our problem. We'll we'll figure out that ng optimize image thing too. Um, anyway, what are we doing? Um, so we've got the ID now. Let's let's commit that. We made a couple of changes. So um, pre-linked images, which is a helpful thing to do. And then we've um, added, you know, bindings to the router. Added URL input bindings. And then the last thing we did is we grabbed the ID from the URL um, and then we swapped, you know, the, the sizing. So, well, sizing. Page that and commit that, push it. And I like to make my commits atomic as atomic as possible. Sometimes it's not possible um, because I just write too much code, but I like I like to do shorter bursts um, and then commit atomic pieces because I could roll these back, right? So if I need to take this out, I could put in a patch that reverts it. If I need to take this out, I could do right? Like some of these things are more difficult than others, but like pre-linking images, it's just one line. And if I take that out, it's not going to break any. We're going to get our warning back, right? This one, on the other hand, if I take this out, um, I probably should have added this um, this piece here, part of that. We'll worry about that later. So the next thing we need to do is just get an article. Um, so for now, we're just going to say const article equals. Um, and we need a service to give us our article. Um, 
because we're eventually going to get our article from um, our CMS. Um, but for right now, we we just want to get it from anywhere. So go ahead and add a new service. We're going to generate our service. Um, we're going to generate an Angular service. The name of our service is going to be our article service. We'll call it our articles service. And actually, there are a lot of places where I should have done this before that I didn't. Yeah, we'll leave it as flat. We can see it's going to be adding it into the source app services, the source app services where we want it. Um, I I love that it runs a dry run as we go through this, um, and it's fine that it puts it flat in that services folder. If I want to move it, I'll move it, but not a whole lot more that we want to change. We're just going to generate this service. And there we go. We've now generated our service. We can close our command prompts. Put that down. So now we've got our articles. We can provide this in root, that's fine. It's complaining that I've got an empty constructor, that's fine, we can get rid of that. Now we're good. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter that the article service is provided in root, it's probably better that it is um, because it can be used from anywhere. So what we want to do is here in our article, um, we want to um, get article. Get article is going to take in article. That will be a string. And it will return an observable. of type article model. There we go. So we need to import our observable. There we go. We're not returning anything, but um, the next thing we want to do is we just want to get a reference to our HTTP client. Um, so we're going to go read only um, e client equals inject e client go now we've got a reference to our http client and then we're just going to return this dot h well actually no that's what we would do if we had our http client and i wanted um we could do it now um I really felt like writing um, an interceptor to intercept that and stuff, but um, um, hey, um, thank you for the follow. Really appreciate it. it means a lot. Um, I'm trying to think here, right? I, HTTP client is the way we're probably going to get these from the um, from the CMS, but really we're just going to return. Um, we'll just use of our XJ. Start of, and here we are going to use um, create test article. Article ID. So there we go. So now we've passed in our ID as our article ID. Um, and the only reason we're doing that is uh, just so that we can show that we're using the input. So here inside of our function, we've told it that, hey, we take partials of the article model. We're destructuring certain parts. Um, and so like the ID, if we provide the ID, we're going to use that. Otherwise, we'll just create a fake ID. Same with title. Um, 
URL. So now, oh, you know what? We want to use that image. We'll, we'll take a look at that here. What we're going to do about it. But now we've got our get article function. Um, so here in our class, just for a const full service check. We're just going to grab the articles service. We're going to import that stuff. Um, and let's make sure that this matches. Um, I make this mistake a lot, and I'm trying to be more conscious about it. But if I call this article service instead of articles service, like I named it, um, it can become confusing to the person who's using it, right? Um, so here is our article. So from the article service, we're just going to get the article with that ID. And that actually brings up a good point. And here, let's um, let's make our article a signal. And so let's make it computed. We're going to make our article computed. Nope, I don't even need to do that. Yes, I do. Absolutely. So here <laughs> we're going to say article service dot get ID. This is this is a bit of a weird one, but here we want this to go to signal. So now um, article turns a signal of a signal. Because now to use the article like down here, um, we could go and go Use this now. We've got to go article that and our JSON pipe, right? We can't do this either. This is one of the downsides to analog import. So, import here, we can add our JSON pipe. We have to do from Angular slash common with log um, So you can't merge these together. Um, they have to be on their own line. That's one of the downsides to using uh, with imports stuff. But because of the way I've done it, um, we'll see that the article requires two. Uh,
So it's even telling me, hey, what you're doing is stupid. So, hmm. So one thing we could do is we can make get article return signal. But I don't even like that. What we could do is we can say, hey, to signal this. We can say to signal, and then inside of here, we can say um, to observable. And this this is something that um, a, a syntax that you'll see people um, complaining about a lot. Um, but we've got our signal um, that we're getting back, right? So article is now a signal. Now we're converting ID to an observable stream, which means that now we can pipe it. And inside of our pipe, we can switch map over the article. And this is probably the cleanest way to handle this. Right? Because we're staying reactive here. Um, so we're converting this observable to a signal, but we're having to convert this signal to an observable and then pipe on it. So yeah. It is what it is. So we're getting our ID from the URL. If that ever changes, then we're getting our article back. Um, this is probably our ID is unlikely to change. So there might be other ways to do this, but this is this is a common pattern that you'll see. Um, and, you know, this two observable, two signal feels a little bit weird, um, but the problem is that we're mixing two types of reactivity, right? The ID um, is one form of reactivity that's much more granular than, uh, than the observables. So we have to convert it to the type and then back to this. And we want it to be a signal type for our template. The nice thing about this is that now we don't need that second call now our article should be we can see our stuff here and we can see our content there We've got our date and our image so we're in a good place we've got our title we're getting this all to the screen we can see that our id matches I could break this.
it the pre-connect? Did the pre-connect break that? So let's go comment that out. Um, because it looked so beautiful and now it does. Comment out. Builds. Only not the pre. That hundred percent width. Oh, I broke it. I broke it with this. That's my problem. This is not the problem. Problem is in the article. Here, this grid area, here, we're just going to say overflow y auto, I'm going to say overflow auto. Actually, we don't need to do this here. A lot of this stuff actually we didn't need here. And that should handle it. That should fix our image. Um, overflow not. If. Overflow auto. Yeah, I blew out my own my own CSS. So it was behaving properly. Yep, it was definitely behaving properly. I just caused a problem. So overflow auto. Want overflow in both. No. O dash X. I don't want to add scroll bars to that div. I want the scroll bar to be here. Along the side. When we look, yeah, we've got. But I don't want scroll bars here. Like nested scroll bars always are fun. Not really. They cause issues. So we will we'll be fixing this up. But and that was scary for a second. Oh no! What did I do to my image? Spent all that time getting it working. Um. Anyway. There we go. So we've got this photo here. And let's take a look at so our image. Of course, now I'm going to grab this from image uh, you, the um, article. Uh, image you are. And we'll see that things are going to be a little bit weird. Pretty weird.
because it's not set. And so now we're getting like some weird issues here. The other thing is that um, we're getting this null stuff here. So one thing we want to do, let's, I'm gonna create a computed. So we're gonna say const image URL equals that but it's possible that this is undefined. And that's what it's showing. So it's possible for that to be undefined. So in the beginning, we're just going to give it nothing. That should make that error go away. Nope. Equals undefined. Oh. Yeah, because I didn't give it anything. I just said, hey, grab nothing. So here, um, we're just going to say image. URL, go, a non-empty string. But we can just say, hmm, how do we deal with this? Because we could get a flash, and that's not what we want. Um, like if I put a test in here, right? And we refresh. Got a broken image. We inspect. Source is test. Not even updating my. Oh. Do as we can say. URL. URL or test. There we go. Does that solve it? Because our tree is broken. Problem. So if we look at the article, the image URL should be this brief 252, but it's not being updated. We are reading this observable or this. Mm. 
computed isn't working. Back is a signal of We we'll figure this out and then I'll end. There are, there are a couple of other things that we want to do here. But does it recognize It is returning this, and that's fine. Um, just struggling to break this down, and so image is not being there, and me. So We're not getting any issues in our console. We are. So it's just not recognizing that that signal needs to change. Does that work? Because now we aren't, that might have been the issue. Yeah. Um, that optional access on, so we could probably even just go image URL. Boom, boom. And here, do image URL. Maybe I was spelling it wrong. Because now it's recognizing that that's a string. Must have had, I'll have to go back and check what I had before. Um, because now it's working. Um, but notice that we've got this weird pixelated image, um, and that's not what we want. Um, and so one of the other things we want to do um, or now is we want to go to get article. Out of here, we can just say, that we will have image equals yeah we could do we could do a tuple um 250 on a 250 and we're going to make this optional but this should be not a number this is going to be eight. Number. Number. So we've declared a tuple. Um, so if we look now, image size is optional, um, but it's a tuple of type number number with height and width. So inside of here, we can just say um, that const eight width equals image. The wrong way to destructure that one. 
Duple, so we destructure it that way. So here, now we can say that, hey, we want to image height of height, image width of width, but it, it's saying, hey, these don't exist, um, which is absolutely true. The next thing we need to do is go to our create test article. Inside of here, we want a partial article model and we want image height number, image width. And so we're we're making image height and image width partials. So now we can pull out image width and image height. You can actually make these two required. They don't have to be partials. We'll do that here. But now it's complaining because I need to do an image height here of 250, image width 250. Now we've got our defaults in place. We're using everywhere. Now we're destructuring our image width and our image height. Um, and so down here in our URL, and now just take this and go, this is our image height. This is a leave. I may have to swap these around. But there we go. So now we can go back to our article service. And that's our height and width. We're getting that in as a tuple. Doesn't like this. Probably. So whatever reason, um, Copilot eats a lot of the closing stuff. Don't know why. Lots of people talk about it. Property. Model. Yeah, I would expect it to. So now our service is now passing in the height and the width. Um, and then the last thing we need to do is just right here. Now we can just say, hey, our get article and here, we want our 1536. So there's our height and our width. Um, and now if we go take a look, article if we look and I've got it backward it should be 320 1536 I went backwards so we're probably getting like a weird uh, error the console saying that, yeah. In 36 width by 320. So I got it, I got it right on accident. Um, so it goes width by height. Um, So that's the width, that's the height. Here is width, height. And the other thing we can do is like right here, we could rename this to be image height. This we can name to be 
image width. And then the other thing we can do is replace these with shorthand properties. Height. And here, did 1536 model in the faker. This is the width first, the height. Now we're we're following the convention properly. So when we reload, now we get wow, oh, that a smoggy seat, or maybe it's the filter that they've applied to make it look smoggy. Could be foggy with bluish filter applied to it. So there we go. Image the largest comp. Modified, this can cause lower slowing. It is recommended not to modify the ng source property on any image that could be the LCP. That is a good call out, too. So, there's probably some optimizations that we can make here, but now we've got our image looking the right way. Um, it's ready for our par parallax um, kind of change, right? As we scroll up, we can animate this easily. Um, that will be nice. Um, I guess we'll get into that tomorrow. Spent a good deal of time talking about um, fundamentals, truth tables, things like that. Um, but uh, we're in a good place. We're now getting our articles from service, and we need to update the rest of our places where we're actually calling that, that fake function. Um, so that'll be something that we we want to do soon. And yeah, I'm happy with where we are. Um, it'll be, I don't know. Like building a blog is an opportunity to learn and to show what you've learned. Um, and so um, I'm kind of wondering if we shouldn't put this on top of our background. Fun. We'll take a look at that um, in the... It would be it would be fun to have our article title maybe be on top. I don't know. That's where things get a little bit crazy because um, then you're dealing with contrast ratios, and then we might have to start adding filters. I don't know if we're going to do that. Uh, but what we could do is if instead of animating this flying out, we have it scroll over the top. Something reload, um, but maybe have this scroll over the top. I don't know. That would be fun. So yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night. Let me just get my camera. Tomorrow is a fairly 
No, yeah, tomorrow I'm fairly free in the afternoon. Um, it doesn't look like I have anything special going on for the stream, so it won't be late or anything like that. Uh, my Mondays have been crazy lately, but I think things are starting to slow down, which is good. It's going to allow me to focus on a lot of other things along with work. So, yeah, tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Mountain, we'll be back. Um, we will finish this up. Um, I will have done my research on the CMS because this stuff is not going to take long. Uh, I don't know how long the parallax scrolling is going to take. Um, it's actually something I want to learn on stream, and so I'm intentionally not going out and researching it and spoiling myself. I want to show you guys how I would go about learning this. Um, because it's not something I've done before, um, but it's something that I think would be fun to um, fun to learn on stream and show you guys how I would go about learning like a new effect or something like that in CSS. Um, yeah, 